on your screen is controlled by you. If you see in the upper right corner, there is a gallery view or a speaker view. So you can control what you're seeing on your screen by um, clicking on those buttons there. And throughout the presentation, you should be able to see the PowerPoint and who's speaking. That's kind of how we have it set up. So um, that, that is available. After the seminar, we are recording this. So if you are interested in um, sharing it with someone, it will be posted sometime next week. And I will email everyone who RSVP'd to, with the link and the information on where you'll find that recording. So at Torrance Memorial, we have been doing most of our um, classes all virtually. Some of the, the classes are not being held right now, but they, uh, many of them are being done through Zoom, Zumba and um, yoga and all of those kinds of things are available. So you can find that information on our website. We do have a couple other lectures also coming up. Um, our, virtu or our Miracle of Living at the Beach is happening on May 19, also via Zoom. It should be interesting. It's reflections from the front lines, lessons learned for a future pandemic with, with Dr. Jamie McKinnell. He will share, he's an infectious disease doctor and he'll share some of his experiences and what we're learning to, uh, to know for any future pandemics, which we hope don't happen again. Um, we also have our Miracle of Living series, which is the uh, health education series. The next one is coming up on June 24, and it will be on the topic of insomnia and sleep issues. You'll, you'll receive more information about that in the June upcoming events and lectures email. And then also the Medicare 101 is continuing virtually. The next one for that is on May 26 at 630. And you can find more information about that at torrencememorialipa.org. Or give me a call on any of these things. I'm happy to share the details with you on that as well. At Torrance Memorial, we are on a path toward normalcy. We're excited about that because a lot of people are getting vaccinated and that's what we need to have happen for us to try and get back to normal, more normal life. I have posted here that as of Tuesday afternoon, we had zero COVID inpatients. That was true, almost. Uh, we, I just checked with our house supervisor this morning and unfortunately before that, that last patient was discharged, we did get a few more. So we actually have six inpatients right now, but none of them are seriously ill. None of them are in the ICU. So uh, we are, but, and we have seen a, a significant decline in those numbers. Back in January, our high point was, was over 260 inpatients. So we are very excited to see the numbers come down. And um, our visitor policy is, uh, has been expanded. Now we are allowed two visitors per patient from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. That went into effect um, on May 4, and which is, has been very helpful because I know it's very difficult for people to not be able to see their loved ones when they're in the hospital. Our volunteers are returning, the volunteers who are so critical to the work we do here and escorting people around the campus the ones who wear the blue jackets, we have nearly 900 of them. And during COVID, anyone 65 and older was not allowed to come. And so they really missed us and we really missed them. So we're happy they have returned as well. So I mentioned that our um, vaccination, and I'm gonna skip over to the next point here that we continue to wear masks on campus here, the temp, um, temperature screening, et cetera, is done when anyone comes to campus and uh, the social distancing and hand sanitizer. We're continuing all of those things, even though they are, some of those restrictions are loosening up in some other places, but we are continuing that here. I've noted here that as of 511, we've given 27,438 vaccination doses. So we are very excited about the numbers of people who are doing that. I wanted to, um, highlight how you can sign up or if you know of anyone who still needs the vaccine that they can go to myturn.ca.gov. Our clinics are now set up on that public site and they're available to anyone 12 years and older. We're giving the Pfizer vaccine here and um, it is that has been approved for, for 12 years and up. Be sure to enter the zip code 90505 when you get through those initial screening um, questions be to see the Torrance Memorial dates. Otherwise, if you don't include that, they, it won't show up. And if none show up and you put that zip code in, it probably means the clinic is full or 
it, we aren't offering one on that date. I did include the first dose clinics here, May 19, 20, 26, and 27. And sorry, this slide is not in your handout. I added it this morning. I thought this was important to highlight. So you could make some notes quick here to determine where you go to get that vaccination appointment. And, uh, and my contact information will again be at the end of the presentation. So you can always reach out to me if you have any questions. So that is, um, and there was one other thing on this previous slide. This has been National Hospital Week, um, May 9 to 15. It happens every year in May. We do some special activities here at the hospital to appreciate everyone who's working. And uh, this, we gave out some raffle prizes and had an ice cream social and some things like that. So it's a, it's a good time to be able to celebrate everyone who is, um, is working in the hospital setting. I mentioned that I'm the director of plan giving. Uh, plan giving is all about those gifts that are built into your estate plan. This is a list of some of the common ones, like the bequest is probably the most common, leaving a small percentage or a big percentage of your, your estate to Torrance Memorial is a way to help support the care that we're able to give to this community and maintain our, our um, status as a, a very important uh, regional medical center. There are some income generating gifts here listed too, and Stuart will be talking about those today. So I just wanted to highlight for a minute um, the uh, importance of beneficiary designations from your IRAs, 403Bs, 401Ks, those kinds of things that you set up as pre-tax accounts um, while you're working and, and at this point. Um, the, once you start taking your required minimum distributions from these accounts, you have to pay taxes on them. So they're a really good tool to use to support, um, you know, to give, to, if you wanna make that part of your legacy to give to charity, to give to Torrance Memorial. So you see that it will save the taxes for your heirs. You can use other parts of your estate to give to your heirs and, um, you know, save the taxes on that when you give it to, the, to Torrance Memorial. And, um, that is just something to, um, to keep in mind. And, and also just a reminder that it's really important that you have your beneficiaries uh, clearly designated on your, on your IRA accounts. It's, it's handled separately from your estate plan, from your will and your trust. So be sure you um, check with your custodian and make sure that is clearly accomplished. We do have a heritage society here at Torrance Memorial. So if you have included us in your estate plan, please let me know so that we can appreciate you while you're with us and we can acknowledge your, um, your great uh, foresight and, and planning for that. Our website uh, does have a lot of great information about plan giving, so you can take a look at that. This personal estate planning, planning kit that's uh, pictured on the screen is a, an amazing tool to help with tracking all of your assets, your accounts, your savings accounts, your house, your children, your, you know, where everything is. You can put it all together in one document. So um, you can download that from that website. And if you have difficulty downloading it, give me a call and I will be happy to send it to you um, either electronically where you can fill it in electronically or I can print a hard copy for you and, and send that your way. Torrance Memorial is a nonprofit hospital. We do depend a lot on donations to continue the support and the great care we're able to give the community. So here is a slide just to help you see how you can participate in that and how you can support. We uh, are really fortunate to have a very supportive community uh, who recognizes how important it is to have a, a solid, good hospital in their community. So that's the information there. So now I'm gonna turn it over to our, one of our co-chairs. I want to acknowledge Grace St. Clair. She's an attorney who is local on our professional advisory council. And she shares the, the chair role for the council with Christian Cordoba, who's a certified financial planner. He's also founder of California Retirement Advisors located in El Segundo. He specializes in retirement planning, 401k and IRA preservation strategies. Chris is coming to us remotely from his office and he's gonna introduce our speakers. Okay, thank you for that, appreciate that. And uh, yeah, excellent, let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, thank you, Sandy. And thank you also for all that you do for Torrance Memorial and our community. Uh, today, I have the honor of introducing our speakers, 
but not yet. <laughs> Before I do, let's get to the formality of the ever coveted disclosures. Uh, so with that, let me disclose that this material is for general information only and is not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine what is appropriate for you, of course, please consult your qualified professionals. Now, today's webinar, as you know, is titled Generating Income for Retirement. What a great topic. And let me tell you that you have a powerhouse trio today that I'm excited about, and I know you'll be glad you attended to learn from them today. Let's begin with Gregory Schill. Greg is a co-founder of the Advisory Group, an SEC-registered investment advisor with offices in Diamond Bar and Torrance, and Greg has been a certified financial planner since 1993, providing clients with financial planning and investment management services for individuals, small business owners, and qualified plan professionals, uh, sorry, qualified plan fiduciaries. Craig, Greg is a past president of the Manhattan Beach Kiwanis Group, uh, a great group, and he has been involved in many charitable organizations over the years in Los Angeles and the South Bay. Thanks for all you do, Greg. All right, next, Stuart Sujimoto. Stuart is also a certified financial planner and a, life, uh, a licensed life and disability insurance agent. He is the regional director and registered principal of the South Bay branch of Satara Advisor Network located there in Torrance. Stuart entered the financial industry in 1968 and he specializes in investment management and retirement planning. And in his business, he takes a strong emphasis on providing the education and information people need to make, uh, need to make intelligent financial decisions. Thanks for being here, Stuart. And last, but certainly not least, Karen Pryor. Karen is the broker and owner of Priority Lending Group in Torrance. As a licensed broker since 1993, she brings almost 30 years of experience to her residential lending business. Educating seniors and financial professionals about the benefits of reverse mortgage lending as part of a retirement plan is her passion, and I'll add a very special niche. In addition, Karen is an active member of the Torrance Area Chamber of Commerce, serving as co-chair of their ambassador program and an incoming member of the board of directors. She was also appointed last December as a commissioner to the city of Torrance Commission on Aging. That's a lot, Karen. Thanks for all you do as well. Okay, let's have some fun and let's get the show started. Greg, take it away, please. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Sandy. And good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our presentation. Uh, my portion of the presentation is going to cover uh, the sources of retirement income. And one of the main sources of retirement income, uh, uh, we're going to show you how to extract income uh, to live on. Then we're also going to cover required minimum distributions. Uh, Sandy says this is a very uh, uh, common question. It's a hot topic. And uh, we want to recover this usually comes up every year and I think it makes sense to uh, go through the details. So let's dive in. There we go. First, I'd like to talk about the sources of retirement income. You can see here on the screen, social security, obviously everyone knows that. Uh, basically, once you hit age 62, you can start, you can wait till uh, full retirement age, 65, 67 for different age groups. You can also defer until age 70. But the bottom line is it's a set dollar amount every month. And that's what we're defining here, a defined income benefit. Uh, some of you may have an old style pension plan from years ago where uh, when you retire, you've got a few options, but it's a monthly set dollar amount that is paid out. Calsters, CalPERS, uh, same thing. Also, you can go and purchase an annuity uh, with your own money. And that also provides a set payment on a monthly basis. So that's what I call these, we're defining a specific uh, monthly payment. Now let's talk about some variable income sources. Most people have an IRA or a rollover IRA, 401k, 403b, 457, thrift, thrift savings plan. I mean, we could go on and on, right? Uh, yeah, but uh, um, those sources are, we're defining a contribution. Yeah, you, you messed me up, Sandy. Yeah. <laughs> You're defining a contribution. 
you have elected deferrals out of your salary with a 401k, it goes in pre-tax, it grows tax deferred. And uh, then uh, when you retire, you have a hopefully a sizable lump sum and you need to turn that into income. That can be a variable income source. You may have stocks and bonds in a brokerage account. Okay, that can be either in your name, it could be in you and your spouse's name as joint owners, it could be in the name of your trust, but you can extract income out of a stock and bond portfolio that's not an IRA. Many of you may have investment real estate. Obviously, that's a very good source of retirement income. And then finally, well, we're missing a bullet point here because we have reverse mortgages and we're going to cover that today. Um, and then we talk, Stuart's going to talk about generating income with a charitable gift uh, 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 discussion. So those are variable income sources. I want to dive into basically uh, discussing income from probably the largest asset most people have when they retire. And that is a rollover IRA, if you will. You know, most people now have IRAs. They have a sizable 401k balance or 403b balance. Most people, when they retire, they consolidate all of these different tax deferred vehicles into a rollover IRA at retirement. It is not required that you do that. But for most people, it, it, it uh, helps them to coordinate the, uh, uh, the retirement income stream. Let's talk about a hypothetical uh, situation here. Uh, let's assume that we have a, uh, a rollover IRA. Let's assume, you know, we don't want to talk about all the different 401k, 403b options. Let's say we have a rollover IRA. And we have a husband and wife, and they have a portfolio designed of a 60% stock, 40% fixed income portfolio. Let's also assume we're just going to use mutual funds. Maybe we have eight or 10 mutual funds that make up this mixture of different types of stock and different types of fixed income options. Okay. Now, the 60-40 is a pretty good risk profile for many people when they reach retirement. Uh, some people might be more aggressive, some people might be less aggressive, but the 60-40 is a good starting point, all right? Now, let's assume that we can have a 7% annualized rate of return on this portfolio over the next five to 10 years. It could be higher, it could be lower, right? And you could have years where you have a 10% return and you could have years where you have a zero or maybe even negative return, but let's assume we can get it to average 7% over the next 10 years. So with that, then we set up a 4% uh, of the value of the IRA distribution, an annualized 4% distribution. Uh, some people may do assume an 8% return and do a 5% distribution, but let's stick with the 4% here. So stop and think, we're, we're going after a 7% growth rate. We have a 4% distribution rate annually. There's 3% that we're not touching, right? And uh, so stop and think, that might allow for some growth in the underlying portfolio net of what you take out to live on. And why do you need that? Well, guess what? The term is inflation and it's in the news a lot right now. And so what we're trying to do here with this little uh, inflation hedge, if you will, in this design is we're trying to offset the ravages of inflation down the road and hopefully you can give yourself a little uh, pay raise, you know, every two or three years, right, in retirement, all right? We just wanna try and offset future inflation. This is a very common strategy, but how do you actually extract the income? Well, we've done this a lot for folks. It's a common strategy. Many of you not, may not be aware of, be aware of it, but you probably all have some substantial money in IRAs, 401ks and whatnot. So let's have our fixed income component. We set the fixed income, and in this case, we're using mutual funds. We set the fixed income components to pay out their monthly income stream if we don't have them reinvest. Most IRAs nowadays, you have these different investment options inside the IRA, and then you have a money market option along with the different mutual funds. So we set the fixed income component to pay the monthly income into the money market, right? And we're gonna use that uh, in a minute. Then we set up monthly planned liquidations from the stock oriented mutual funds. 
Right now, you know, uh, uh, fixed income options are paying between effectively zero on a CD or four, four tenths of a percent or something like that uh, to approximately 3%. Uh, you could find junk bonds and maybe you can get four and a half to five and a half percent, but you would not want to have a portfolio of nothing but junk bonds, obviously. So the fixed income, op income options are only going to pay maybe one, two, three percent. So you need to, to add some money from your equity positions, all right? So basically we set up planned liquidations. This is a computerized strategy. Almost every custodian allows it and most of them don't charge for it. So you can set up a planned liquidation of a specific dollar amount or a percent of that stock or in a mutual fund. It's just like the income from the fixed income options, it's over here. You strip that money off, it goes into the money market, and then on whatever day of the month you decide, you can have an electronic transaction from the money market inside your IRA out to your checking account. You got your paycheck for the month, okay? It works pretty good. Now, there are some uh, uh, qualifications here. Uh, you are investing in stocks and bonds and uh, the markets do go up and down, but over time they generally do you know, increase and as long as you're patient, patient and you're willing to live with a few ups and downs in the stock market, more so than the bond market, um, this tends to work well over time, but there are no guarantees. I just wanna make that clear. Very, very uh, straightforward strategy. It's used very widely. And if it's something new to you, uh, hopefully we've helped uh, uh, enlighten this as a, enlighten you with as a, uh, this is a valid option. All right, now let's switch gears and talk about required minimum distributions. Uh, as I said earlier, Sandy, uh, you know, gets a lot of questions on this. So we wanted to cover this again, we usually cover at least once a year, right? Anyway, the IRS and its infinite wisdom years and years and maybe decades ago uh, said, hey, wait a minute. If we've got all these people putting money into their 401k pre-tax, we're not getting any tax revenue off of those deposits. And in all the money that's in there, it's growing tax deferred. We're not getting any income stream off of that. So these folks, when they get to retirement age, they have a pretty good little you know, uh, portfolio that's worth a bit of money. We haven't gotten any tax revenue off of that. Well, basically, even if you don't need the money in retirement to live on, the government created the required minimum distribution rules so that you would give them some tax revenue every year in retirement. Hence, we have the required minimum distribution rules. Even if you don't need the money to live on, they're gonna force you to take a distribution and pay tax on it. Once you turn age 72, you're required, you're required to take distributions from IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, 457 plans starting in the year you turn 72. You have to take a distribution in that age 72 year and then every successive year after that. All right, you must take the each year's RMD before the end of the calendar year. If you do not take that distribution by the end of the year or you take partial and you don't meet the minimum, you will have a 50% penalty tax on the amount you did not take out to meet the minimum. You can always take out more than you uh, than the minimum each year, but remember, this is all pre-tax money. So when you take money out, the more you take out, the higher the tax burden will be. Now let's talk about the Secure Act. This, this the Secure Act was signed into law December twentieth of twenty nineteen. It changed the required minimum distribution start date from the year in which you turn seventy two to the age seven, excuse me, the year in which you turn 70 and a half to the year in which you turn age 72. These new RMD rules are required for anyone who turns age 72 after December 31st, 2019. Anyone who uh, turned age 70 and a half prior to this date, you are required to follow the original RMD rules and you have to start taking a distribution at age 70 and a half and each successive year after that. Now let's talk about how do you take the distribution? How do you calculate it? 
Well, you have to obtain your prior year end account balance. You look up the life expectancy factor. We have a little subset of that right here. To the right here, you see the uniform life uh, expectancy table uh, as part of it. Uh, that's the most common table. We're gonna use that for our example. You see for age 72, you uh, go across to the right and you see the life expectancy factor of 25.6. Let's do an example. Let's assume you're turning age 72 in the year 2021, this year. You have two IRAs. They're both worth 100,000 at the end of last year. That's the key element. You have to obtain the prior year end value uh, as of December 31st of the prior year to calculate the current year's RMD. In this case, we have two IRAs. They were worth 100,000 each at the end of 2020. We have a $200,000 IRA. So remember we had the age 72 uh, factor of 25.6. So we divide the $200,000 IRA value by the 25.6. That's $7,800 is your required minimum distribution for this calendar year. Now, the reason I showed two IRAs is many people have more than one IRA. You do have the ability to aggregate these IRA dollars do the calculation like we did here, and you can take the, the required distribution from only one IRA if you want to. You don't need to take it from all of them. Some people still do, but you can aggregate the calculation and take the distribution from one of, let's say, five IRAs. That's your decision. Now, that same aggregation applies to 403B accounts and 457 accounts. If you have two 403Bs, you can do the same aggregation and you can take the money out of one 403B as opposed to both of them. The exception to all of this is 401Ks. That's in the code. 401Ks require you to take a distribution from each 401K. There's still plenty of people out there that have 401Ks. They've been retired and they're still with their employer. So your employer, the, 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 uh, the custodian of that, is going to require you take an RMD out of that particular 401K. You have multiple 401ks. Again, you're going to have to take multiple RMDs. Now you can see, as I said earlier, uh, if you consolidate all of this into a rollover IRA, you know, it makes life a lot easier for doing these calculations and these distributions. If you don't like RMDs and you'd like to reduce your RMDs, one option is to do a Roth IRA conversion. Roth IRAs, most of you were familiar with that. Um, you have a, a contribution made to a Roth. It's put in after tax. Remember, you make a contribution to a 401k or an IRA, it's put in pre-tax. The, the investment grows tax deferred over the years, but you get a big benefit in the back end is that as long as the account's been in existence five years and you're past the age of 59 and a half, you can take the uh, contribution and the earnings out tax Free. For young people, this is a great long-term benefit. You got many, many years to let that money compound for you, right? And, and you can take tax-free distributions. Well, you can also convert your IRA into a Roth IRA, but you're going to have to pay tax in the current year on the amount you uh, convert. So that amount you convert, fine. You don't have to do an RMD on that uh, money in the future. Um, if you don't want to uh, incur a big tax bite, you may consider uh, uh, converting over multiple years to reduce the tax implications. Now, uh, with this, uh, a couple of caveats. If you can't leave the money alone for the long term to let it build up some, uh, you know, let it compound and build up some uh, earnings that could be tax free, um, you might reconsider that the RMD isn't as bad as you originally thought, and maybe you don't do the conversion. Secondly, if you're age 63 as an example, and you decide, hey, I don't want these RMDs, um, I'm going to uh, uh, convert this, uh, you have to wait until age 68 to take money out of that account. It has to be in there five years before you can take the, the earnings out tax free. So just be aware of that. That is one way to reduce your RMDs. Another way 
is a qualified charitable distribution. Uh, in December of 2015, Congress passed legislation. You can now uh, annually give $100,000 out of your IRA to a qualified charity and you don't pay tax on that distribution. You must be over the age of 70 and a half and this distribution counts towards your RMD. An example, let's say you have a $20,000 RMD and you decide you're going to give 10,000 of it to Torrance Memorial. Thank you, Sandy, yes. And uh, you, you make the distributions. At the end of the year, you get a 1099R. I mean, that's the taxable portion of the distribution. It's only $10,000. The 10,000 that was given to charity, it's not taxed to you. Okay, now one element here, uh, you cannot write the check. If you wanna do a distribution to a charity, your custodian has to write the check directly to the charity, just be aware of that. One final item here on reducing your RMDs, a QLAC, Qualified Longevity Annuity Contract. You can consider using this if you wanna reduce an R, your RMD calculation. Basically, you can take up to 25% or, or $135,000 of your retirement account balance and effectively buy a deferred annuity, okay? That's what it basically is. So that money that's set aside into the deferred annuity, the QLAC, it does not have to be included in your RMD calculation each year going forward. Um, you can defer the uh, uh, income from this until age 85. You have to annuitize at age 85. You can have lifetime income. Um, with rates so low, you need to do some analysis because you know the income stream, once you do annuitize, it might not be as much as you would like. Um, one additional issue is that once you make the decision to do this, it's irrevocable. You can't change your mind two years later and go back, okay? That's the QLAC. So I've covered everything I need to, and uh, hopefully I've uh, given you some good information. I'll turn this over to Stuart. Thank you, Greg. Um, wanted to remind you, we'll take questions at the end. So if you will uh, put the, post them in the uh, chat room, whatever. Anyway, I'll try to be fairly brief with this. A couple of things I want to importantly mention is Sandy mentioned the uh, charitable gift annuity. One way to look at it is if you have a certificate of deposit today, and you're getting one eighth of 1%. You, oh, let's see if we have it. Okay. Uh, if you look at the difference in income that it can generate for you. Uh, and one other comparison that I like to make, you can see from this, the amount of income that you're gonna receive. The important to me, thing to me is, if you do an annuity, if you have an annuity and you annuitize it, you have to remember that the insurance company is guaranteeing you a certain amount of income for the rest of your life. What happens when you die or if it's a joint life, they get to keep the rest. The difference is here is you're probably getting a little bit more money from this, two big advantages. One is that you get a tax deduction when you do it. And the second is that whatever remaining is going to a charity of your choice. And in this case, we hopefully it's towards more. Uh, for my portion of it, I would like to talk about charitable remainder trust. Uh, I appreciate what Greg has covered. He's done a great job on talking about, um, you know, income and all. Charitable remainder trust is nothing more than you taking an asset, putting it into a charitable trust that the end beneficiary is a charity you get the income during your life or it can be during you and your spouse's life or you can do a number of years. You can have it so that if you pet, you're getting on in age and you have it uh, come out in 20 years or whatever. The three principal situations where a charitable trust becomes important to you, okay? 
you own an asset that has a very large capital gains, uh, and it will generate a large tax liability. Number two, where you need income. And the, the examples I will use will kind of show you where this comes into play. And the third is that you have a charitable goal and interest. The first example I will use is uh, we had a client that had a fair amount of stock that he had quite a bit of capital gains on. And when we talked about a charitable trust at first, he said, I'm not that charitably minded. What do I want to give away this money for? So we ran an illustration for him. Well, what happened is, is that if he put this in the trust, he had no capital gains tax to pay when he sold the stock. He received an additional $600,000 tax write-off. And if he couldn't use all that write-off that year, he could carry it over for another five years. Well, in this case, they were, taking, they were getting $70,000, 7% a year of income which is a lot more than the dividends that stock was paying, okay? Secondly, a year later, he sold another hundred, uh, another million dollars worth of stock and it sheltered a lot of the gain on that. So it gave them a little flexibility. The interesting part this, uh, about this particular example is, is that for the next two years, uh, Greg mentioned that you can give up to $100,000 of your RMD. He gave Torrance Memorial $100,000 two years in a row. Very generous, very generous doctor. And he had an interesting story in the, one of the Torrance magazines about how he had given to Torrance Memorial and why. Um, my second example is a lady that had some stock that her husband left her. They had a fair amount of capital gains. The interesting thing was it was worth $290,000 and her dividends were only seven to $8,000 a year. Kind of sounds like the interest that you're getting on CDs today, okay? So what we did, we just ran the illustration. And in this case, uh, it avoided having to pay taxes on $112,000 of capital gains. She got an additional write-off of $148,000. And she was, she was getting 8% a year in income. Now, the interesting thing about this story is about two years after she set up the trust, she calls me and she says, oh, you know what? I'm getting married to my handyman. And I'm telling you this example because I think our problem is we make, we're too quick to make judgments. And the first thing that went through my mind is her, her handyman is 57 years old and she's 76 years old. So what went through my mind, right? It's, and it sounds kind of funny, but they, after that, they, you know, they moved up to Northern California and Every couple of years, she'd call me and she'd tell me how much in love she was. They opened up a restaurant up there. She lived for approximately 16 years after that. And he took very good care of her. You know, and uh, so I think that's a story that I like to share with people. So don't be too quick on your judgments. Uh, the third example is where it can really hurt if you have to pay taxes. These two brothers bought a piece of property in 1974 for $75,000, just an 18-acre parcel of land out in Moreno Valley. Uh, they had a chance, almost had a chance, to sell the property in 1989. If you've been around long enough and you know how real estate has jumped up and down, 1989 real estate was at a very good high. They almost sold it for $2 million, but then the deal fell through. And so I met them in 1992, 93, when we talked about the charitable trust. What's interesting about this situation is when we had the property appraised, it was worth $1.5 million. So 
by putting it in the trust, they knew they were, if we got, were able to sell it, they're gonna save a lot of income taxes and they got some additional tax write-offs. Well, what happened is when we tried to sell it, we couldn't even sell that property for $600,000. So in their case, we said, hold the property, keep it for five years so that we don't get the IRS this, you know, uh, telling us that this does not qualify and you can't get the write-offs. Then, surprisingly, if you remember in 2007, we had some serious recession problems in 2007, eight and nine. In 2007, somebody came along and offered a million dollars cash for the property. Well, then we had an attorney that was involved with this charity and, and they had some uh, discussions. They had it reappraised. It eventually sold about a year later for two and a half million dollars. And so in this case, they saved all of that capital gains tax. And since there were two brothers, we split it into two separate trusts. They were both married at the time. So they each got approximately $1.2 million. They've been getting 70 to $80,000 a year. And that's right through that recession we had in 2007, eight and nine. Um, they got an $800,000 tax write-off on top of that. And unfortunately, the uh, gentleman passed away last year, 2000, early 2020, and his wife passed away later in the year, but he was 105 years old. So he lived a good uh, life through the time period. But the surprising thing is, and, and fortunately for the charity, they got a little over a million dollars. He spread out among three charities, but it was a million dollars still went to the charity. So this kind of shows you where that is. And uh, before I get to this part here, one thing I'd like to mention is that I've been in the business a long time. And I would say that one of the most rewarding things I've ever done is doing these charitable trusts because it's been good for the person that did it. It's been good for the charities. And I'm okay with everything else that happens on it. So it's been very good. The final thing that I would like to touch on, you know, when we talk about income and generating income and, and uh, one of the things that I know Greg mentioned several times, you, you know, nothing's guaranteed, you have the market risk. When you set up income for life, the first thing you have to think about is market risk. Some people say, well, I can just put it into a certain bond or I can put it into a CD and there's no risk. Well, you do have a second risk. Your second risk is inflation. And then the third risk is living too long. Because if you think about it, I mean, I remember 20, 25 years ago when you talk about investing for 10 years, and people would come in if they're 70 or 75 years old, and they'd always say, I don't have 10 years. But some of those people are still around at 85 and 90. An interesting part of that uh, last CRT that I talked about, his brother still has his CRT going, and he's 99 years old now. So I think they have longevity in the family, and that kind of touches on living too long. That's the good part of it. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for attending. And uh, now I'd like to turn this over to Karen Pryor. Thanks, Stuart. Good afternoon. So reverse mortgages. There's a topic to get uh, live in a conversation with any senior. Uh, when I ask people what they think about reverse mortgages, I generally get one of two responses. Either they don't really know much about them, so they don't have an opinion. Or sadly and more commonly, I get the, yeah, those are no good. Those are bad. That's usually the response I get. So I'm hoping that this afternoon, the time we have together, that I can show you some of the benefits of having a reverse mortgage and how it can support and enhance a retirement income plan. And at the very least, maybe give you some food for thought. 
So reverse mortgages are divided into two basic categories. You have your FHA product and you have your jumbo products. Now, since our time is limited this afternoon, I'm gonna be focusing just on the FHA product and specifically on the FHA adjustable HECM. Now, the FHA Home Equity Conversion Mortgage, otherwise known as the HECM, it's been around for over 30 years. It was signed into law in 1988. It is a loan specifically designed for seniors and it allows them to access a portion of their home's value using that home's collateral. There are age requirements. You do have to be at least 62 and the other spouse or borrower needs to be a minimum of 18. And counseling is required before the application can be completed. So there needs to be a counseling call. Generally it's done by phone. Um, I don't know that there's any meeting in person anymore right now, but it generally lasts about an hour. These are HUD approved counselors and you can invite anyone to the call that you want to have, you know, ask questions. You can have family members, you can have your financial advisors. The only person you can't have is me or a loan officer. So the borrower has obligations. They must continue to pay all of the property charges. So your property taxes, your homeowner's insurance, if you're in an association, your HOA dues, you must continue to pay all of those. It's available on your primary residence only. So no second homes, no investment properties. And at least one of the borrowers needs to remain in the property. So if you had a situation where uh, one spouse needs to go into assisted living, as long as the other spouse is remaining in the property, that's okay. It's basically available on all property types, including two to four units, as long as the borrowers are occupying one of those units. And it's designed as a first lien only product. Now, this doesn't mean that, you're, that you need to have your property free and clear. It just means that if you do have an existing mortgage, the reverse does have to pay that off. And there cannot be any secondary financing behind it. So how much can you borrow? That's based on three factors. So first is the age of the youngest borrower. So if you have a 65 year old and a 55 year old, it's gonna be based on that 55 year old's age. It's also based on, the, based on the value of the property. Now, FHA caps the maximum value. So each year it tends to increase. This year it's at 822,375. Now, what that means is that that's the value they're gonna use. So if your property's worth a million, then that amount over that 822 number is just not taken into account. So the, the amount that you qualify for will be based just up to that 822 amount. And lastly, the interest rate that's associated with the program that you're getting. So the first reverse mortgage has matured, like hopefully all of us do. Uh, back in 2017, there was legislation that was enacted to basically strengthen and protect the viability of the program. The goal was to really make reverse mortgages more of an ongoing retirement. You know, they wanted to factor it into your retirement plan. They wanted to really get away from people who were using it as a last resort, as a last ditch effort to raid the cash on the home. They wanted to make this more of a thoughtful, planned, you know, they wanted people to think about getting the reverse mortgage. So what did they do? They put uh, a lending limit. They put a limit on what you could access in the first year. So basically the first year you're allowed to access up to 60% of the amount available. Now there is a an exception to that, if you have a mortgage on your property that exceeds that amount, you are allowed to pay that off and access an additional 10%. But basically they wanted to limit the amount that you can access that first year to just 60% of your proceeds, just as a way of protecting people from grabbing it all and running to Vegas and putting it all on red. So don't wanna do that. Uh, there are financial assessment requirements. So previously, you didn't even have to show that you had money available to pay your property taxes, which is not a good idea. So now you have to, or not now, but since 2017, you do have to show that you have adequate income to pay your property charges. So taxes, insurance, HOA dues, any credit that, or any debt that shows up on your credit report. So if you have a car loan or credit card payments, and then also a residual income requirement. So based on the family size, there is this residual income requirement, which is just like disposable income. They wanna make sure that you have adequate funds to make this successful. 
And in addition, they also put in spousal protection for younger spouses in case the older one predeceases them. So this is really no longer a tool of last resort. Now, FINRA, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, uh, very famously or infamously said that in the past, they thought this was just a last resort product, that basically you needed to have exhausted everything else you had and then, you know, okay, maybe you can get a reverse mortgage. So the financial industry said, well, is that really true? Let's, why don't we take a look at this? So the American College of Financial Services, which is an institution that educates and certifies financial advisors, started doing research to see exactly if it really was to be used as a last resort. And they said, you know, if you're waiting to use this product, that's really when you're gonna have the worst outcome. And so it was actually shown to be better if you strategically get that reverse mortgage earlier in retirement. And so when they presented these findings to FINRA back in 2014, they said, uh, yeah, that actually makes more sense and it should be taken under advisement as, as like any other investment products. So they changed their stance on that. And what they really realized was this could be a powerful tool in your retirement income plan as far as in potentially increasing the amount that you have available to spend and the amount that you have available for your heirs. So speaking of tools, if you're wanting to get that nail into that board, there is an obvious tool choice here, which is no surprise, the hammer. So does that mean that the saw and the screwdriver are bad? No, it just means that they're not the right tool for that job. So along those lines, the reverse mortgage is a financial tool. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, when people say, oh no, those are no good, they're bad. Well, a reverse mortgage is being a tool, it's neither good nor bad. It's it's whether or not it's right for your particular situation. So it is really important to understand what your retirement goals are, how a reverse, a reverse mortgage works, and to talk with somebody who is experienced with reverse mortgages and also bring in your financial advisor. Because I've had people say, well, I'm not gonna really say anything about this. I'm just gonna kind of have it on the down low. And, and it's like, if your financial advisor doesn't know all the tools that you have available, they're gonna, not be able to utilize that to create a, possibly a, a better outcome for you. So it's really important that you bring them in on, bring them in on the loop. So generating income is the topic of our conversation today, but I put an asterisk after income because it's important for me to point out that a reverse mortgage does not generate income. It generates loan proceeds. And that's a very important distinction because income is taxable. Loan proceeds are not. So that's something that's very important to remember. Uh, part of what the American College of Financial Services and other financial scholars uh, this came up with when they were doing their research was that there were many different uses for the reverse mortgage, such as replacing your conventional mortgage so that you can have a more effective way to manage your cash flow. Now, I talk to people who say, well, I have five to 10 years left on my mortgage and I'm very comfortable in making a payment, so maybe I'll consider a reverse mortgage after I've paid this off. So my, I usually come back and say, well, if you're comfortable in making payments, why don't you refinance and replace your conventional mortgage with a reverse and continue to make payments? And usually I get the deer in headlights look because people don't think you can make payments on a reverse mortgage. And that's one of the things that people need to know, that it's a very good financial tool. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, one, it's going to reduce your loan balance. And two, any payment that you make on a reverse mortgage will re not only reduce the loan balance, but it will also add to the funds available on the line of credit option, which we'll talk about in a, uh, we'll talk about that more in a minute. You can also use it to manage your investment performance risk. Now, this is also known as market risk, sequence of return risk, and I am not a financial advisor. That would be these gentlemen, so I'm just gonna give you a general overview on that thought process that they came up with. Um, basically, if you're obtaining a reverse, mor a reverse mortgage early on in retirement, you add an additional funding source. 
And how can that be used? Well, when you're taking distributions from an asset that's declining in value, it's not a great position to be in. So the idea behind using reverse mortgage in this situation is to take distributions from the reverse mortgage in the year following the down market so that the reverse, so that the portfolio has a chance to recover. Now, obviously there is more involved in that. That's something that you should definitely talk to your, uh, to your financial advisor about, but it is another tool that can be used. Um, and studies have actually been shown that this is a way of helping your retirement assets last longer. So uh, you can also utilize a reverse to manage or to preserve your low cost basis assets. You can establish an emergency fund. So this line of credit feature, the line of credit on a reverse mortgage is unique in the fact that once it's established, it cannot be reduced, eliminated, frozen, like some of us remember from 2007-ish, when the lines of credit that people had were all of a sudden overnight no longer available to them. With the reverse mortgage line of credit, that's not the case. So once it's established, it is available and it, is, it grows independent of the value of the property. So this reverse mortgage line of credit is going to grow at the same interest rate that you're paying on the loan. And again, a lot of people don't realize that option exists. You can also convert your proceeds to a monthly payment. This is known as a tenure payment. And the tenure payment exists for as long as you live in the property. So in the case where you have somebody who lives to 105, they're gonna be receiving that monthly payment for the entire life. Again, they have to stay in the property, they have to meet their obligations by paying all their property costs. You can also use a reverse mortgage to fund long-term care insurance or to pay for somebody to come in and give you some help once you get a little bit older. Um, Roth IRA conversions can also be paid for with a reverse mortgage. This is something that I've talked to Chris about, and this is something that you should definitely talk to your financial advisor about for guidance. You can delay taking Social Security until full retirement age. I had a borrower a couple of years ago who wanted to retire two years ahead of his full retirement age. So in talking with his financial advisor, he gave him a monthly amount that he could expect to, to receive from Social Security. And we set up the reverse mortgage with a 24 month payout to him on a monthly basis so that he would start receiving that amount. And in that way, he was able to retire earlier and he was much, much happier for that. You can also fund charitable contributions, like to my favorite charity here at the hospital, which is the Lundquist Lurie Cardiovascular Institute. Uh, I have firsthand knowledge of the incredible work that they do because five years ago when my husband had a heart attack, we saved his life. So there's a lot of great organizations here at Torrance Memorial that you can support. And you can also fund educational expenses, either for your children, grandchildren, or Heck, you could get into your, you could just start a whole new career in your retirement and pay for your own educational expenses. So let's talk about a couple of situations. First, we have uh, we have Elvis. Elvis is uh, 70 years old. He's planned and saved for his retirement. His home is worth uh, 825,000. He doesn't have a mortgage on it, and he currently lives alone. And longevity runs in his family, so he is concerned that even though he has planned that maybe 10 or 15 years down the road, he might need a little more help and want to bring somebody in to help him so that he can stay at home. So the solution that we came up with was to obtain a reverse mortgage now, leave all those funds on the line of credit feature because it's going to grow over time. And then for this scenario, we converted it into a monthly payment that he was going to start receiving at year 13. So what does that look like? He was going to qualify for about 455,000. He was going to start receiving monthly payments of a little over $4,800 in year 13. And he will receive those for the rest of his life, no matter how long he lives, as long as he stays living in the property and pays his property charges. In this situation, I've shown a home appreciation rate of about 2%, which is relatively conservative for the South Bay. And so the estimated equity in 25 years is almost $500,000.
And, and actually by putting that reverse in place, the line of credit growth is about $150,000 over that first 13 years. So this graph that I have, and which hopefully you can all see, the red arrow is pointing to the line of credit feature. So as it starts on the left-hand side, it kind of increases slowly upward. That is the growth factor that that line of credit has. And in year 13, basically that line of credit just drops to nothing and goes away. So the orange line on the bottom, which is just kind of chilling there for a while, all the way through year 13, it then starts going up because he starts to receive his monthly payments. So the loan balance starts to increase. The two lines at the top of the graph, the black line just represents the value of the property growing at 2%. That blue line though is the net equity line. So that is the difference between the value of the home and the loan balance. And you can see that even after 30 years, if you go all the way to the right, there is still equity in the property. So that's really important to note. So let's talk about Lucy and Ricky. They want to know if you can get a reverse mortgage and still have equity left for your heirs. So Lucy and Ricky are 80 years old. They live in Redondo Beach and they've actually been in their home for 40 years. So they still owe about 85,000 on a mortgage they took out a while ago and they're making a thousand dollar a month payments, which is very comfortable for them. But what they've decided is that they are really tired of having their 1960 kitchen and they want to upgrade that. They need a new roof on their house. And I believe they wanted to um, invest in an electric vehicle so they could be a little more environmentally friendly. So the bottom line is they decided they needed about $200,000 to accomplish all of these goals. Now they came to me for a conventional refinance. And when we were talking about it, even though they would qualify to get a conventional loan, it was going to be really tight and it really was not going to leave them a whole lot of disposable income. And they were really kind of uncomfortable with that. And they said, they don't know if they, if they really wanted to borrow all that money, although they really wanted to get all these things accomplished. And then plot twist, their adult daughter entered the conversation and said, uh, hey, I really wanna live in this property. So when we started talking about the alternate of a alternate suggestion of a reverse mortgage, the daughter was very concerned. She said, you know, I don't know what's gonna happen with that because if the balance gets too high, I may not be able to afford to refinance it. So what we came up with was having a reverse mortgage put on the property and Lucy and Ricky continued to make their thousand dollar a month payments. So what did that do? It allowed them to make a payment that was comfortable for them. The payment kept the loan balance from getting too high and a bonus, it adds it to the line of credit so that they have money available to them. So they would qualify for a little over half a million dollars with the reverse mortgage. Again, I'm showing a property appreciation rate of about 2%. They're gonna to continue to make their payments, which decreases the loan balance and increases funds available on their line of credit. So this graph, you have at the bottom, you have the loan balance line and the, equity, the line of credit line. And over time, they kind of switch places because when they're making payments, that loan balance line goes down and then it just kind of tapers off. It still goes up slightly over the years, but the bottom line is, is if we take a look at 10 years out, the loan balance is just over 250,000, which was completely doable for the daughter to refinance should she need to at around that time. In addition to that, their line of credit is now got a value of about 390,000 if anything were to happen and they needed that emergency fund. And you can see that the, the net equity line on there is huge. They've still got a ton of equity in that property. So in this situation, we really took a lot of stress off this couple because they really wanted to do these things and really didn't think that they would be able to. So what's the bottom line? Please get the facts about reverse mortgages. A reverse mortgage is not a scam. Scams are perpetrated by dishonest people who prey on fear and ignorance and use a variety of financial products to do so. Just look at all the scams that have popped up since COVID's been around. It's incredible what people come up with. Knowledge is key in determining whether or not a reverse mortgage is a good choice for you. If you don't have all the facts, you're gonna you're going be making decisions based on 
fear or based on something that you overheard your neighbor talking about. So hopefully I've given you some food for thought. Thank you for listening. And I guess we're going to go to the questions. Karen and Stuart and Greg for those great presentations. We are going to move into the, the Q&A time right now. We've got a couple um, questions in advance. So um, I'm going to have Greg start. And if you'll read the question and then provide the answer and be sure your mic is on. And um, it is green. Have one for, there you go. Okay. The first question, <clears throat> does an RMD apply if you are still working? If not, when does it start when you no longer have any earned income? Uh, if you are still working and you have IRAs, non-401ks, right? Uh, you do have to take RMDs on those uh, accounts. However, if your employer allows for it and you were not a five, oh, over here, not a 5% not a or more owner in the company, you can delay the RMDs. Um, if you're gonna continue working for a while, a planning idea, you may want to consider if your employer allows it again to roll your IRAs into the 401k plan, and then you can delay the RMDs until you retire. I wouldn't do it if you only have a year left. Um, in the year you retire, uh, your employer will most likely make you take a required minimum distribution before they give you the funds to roll over uh, based on the prior year end value of the 401k. Okay. Thanks, Greg. And Karen, if you want to take care of yours, you'll read the question and then provide the answer. And to our audience, if you have questions, please submit them via chat. Uh, we will, uh, we do have uh, a few minutes here yet, a good 15 minutes to be able to answer those questions. So please submit them and we'll try and answer them for you. Okay, so the question I got says, does a reverse mortgage apply only to real property? What if one lives full time in a recreational vehicle and has no other place to live? In essence, does an RV qualify as a manufactured home for reverse mortgage purposes? Sadly, no. <laughs> it does have to be real property. It has to be permanently affixed to the land. So, all right, that was a, a that pretty, pretty straightforward pretty answer. Straightforward. So that's good. Yeah. I meant to say at the beginning that we are back in the auditorium here at the Torrance Memorial Campus again. We did that last year and it worked out well. So it's just the presenters and myself here in the auditorium. So we're still, you know, we sure miss that live audience. But I also want to give a shout out to Mitchell Yee, who's helping us on the cameras here today, doing our technical support. And my colleague, Margaret Duran from the foundation office is monitoring the questions. And she uh, is going to provide, read any, are there any questions, Margaret? No other questions. All right. I guess uh, we, everybody did such a great job explaining things that we don't, um, have any questions. I do want to add a little bit more about the uh, charitable gift annuities. I'm going to go back to that and um, because we didn't provide a lot of explanation about what that um, really was. So it takes a minute here to get back to that right screen. But the charitable gift annuity is the opportunity for you to make a, a donation essentially to you, you write your check to, instead of putting it in a CD or something, you would, you would write it to the Torrance Memorial CGA fund, which is managed by Wells Fargo. And uh, we 20,000 is, is what we prefer as a minimum. Um, we, we will consider something lower, but not less than 10,000. And you'll set that up in, uh, in the fund and you get guaranteed income for the rest of your life. The percentage, as you note on this chart, is based on your age. So if you're 75, when you put in the 20,000, you're gonna get a 5.4% rate of income every year for the rest of your life. So that, um, it shows kind of what that would be. Your annual income would be $1,000 a year. You can get that paid monthly, quarterly, semi-annually or just once a year. 
and, um, and that will continue. And as you note at the bottom there, if you set up a CD at the bank, it's probably not gonna give you much more than a 1.25% interest or sometimes even less than that. So it, it really is a great way to get that income. And after you're gone, then the remainder in that fund comes to Torrance Memorial. So it's really a great tool to get some income and, and support Torrance Memorial as well. So I have three other ages on this screen, the 78 or 80. You can see the difference there of what it does with the um, percentage of income you receive. There also is the opportunity to do a deferred charitable gift annuity. With that, you might be 65 years old and you know you're gonna work until you're 70, so you really don't need any additional income, but at 70 or at 75, you might want to have something else that's gonna supplement. So you establish the gift annuity at age 65 with deferred income payments at 75, for example. And so the, the calculations are made for that percentage, what you'll receive in annual income, what it would be at age 75. And in the meantime, your $20,000 is earning um, interest and growing so that by the time you, know, you get to 75, it ha it's a bigger fund and your income amount will be greater. So there are lots of different ways to set that up. And uh, it, it's just um, a really great tool to, to establish another income source for you while you're, you're uh, with us. So I just wanted to provide a little additional explanation on that. So Stuart, do you wanna add something to that? Un unmute your mic and you can, you can uh, add to it. Uh, just want to add that if anybody wants an illustration, Sandy can get a, uh, an illustration for you on a charitable remainder trust because you need to figure out what the possible write-offs are, how much income you're going to receive and all. And I, I can tell you we've run, I've probably run a hundred of them over the last several years. Then everybody doesn't do it, but the thing is, and once you see it, then you can decide whether it fits your situation. So Sandy has her phone number on here. And if you can call her, um, you can get a free illustration run. Thanks, Stuart. That's very true. And I also went back to the slide that shows our plan giving website. There's actually a calculator on that website where you can play around with this yourself. You can put in, you can choose the option of a charitable gift annuity, a deferred charitable gift annuity, a charitable remainder trust. There's also such thing as a charitable lead trust. So there are a number of different kinds of income generating uh, plan giving tools. And if you go to that website, you can find the calculator there and you can even play around with that yourself. You put in your age, you put in what your, what your um, donation would be and uh, the amount of that, any cost basis, you can play around with those numbers. But also please feel free to call me or email me. I'm happy to, to go through that whole process with you. As Stuart said, I have the software that allows those, um, those illustrations to be produced to, for your specific situation. So Margaret, any, any questions come in? No questions. I'm looking at her. You can't see Sandy. this on camera, but I'm looking at her in the control booth. So, Sandy. yes, I was. Can I can I do... add one item yes, to, to yes. the discussion? So, can you go to the uni, uh, unified uh, table, you know, for the RMDs on my about halfway through mine, right there, right there. Okay, uh, right now this the, the unified table. It's based on life expectancy. That's at what the least. Look at the camera, Greg. Okay. They can't see it's at least the... uh, 30 years old. Uh, the IRS is updating the tables, and I think they will be put into use, Stuart, but uh, next year. I believe that's the case. And what's interesting is the age 72 number of 25.6, since people are living longer, the factors are going to change, okay? So right now, if you turn 72, um, you have to use a factor of 25.6. It's effectively 3.9% of the IRA value. Next year, if the new tables are adopted, the new factor for age 72 will be 27.4, which drops from 3.9% of the value to 3.6% of the value. 
it's just slight, slightly less than, less than a 7% reduction in the required amount. So that should happen with the release of the new uh, IRS uh, tables. One thing to add to that, that table is not your life expectancy. Right. It's your life plus somebody 10 years younger. So the thing to remember is that you don't really have to take it all out till you're uh, 115 years old. And I think under the new tables, it'll probably go closer to 120 because they're using your age plus somebody 10 years younger. But if your spouse is more than 10 years younger, you can use the joint life. Yeah, one thing I saw in the new tables that if you're 120 years old or older, the, the factors too. <laughs> so, it, you know, you, you still can have a little bit of an IRA value at age 120. Yeah. All right, it looks like we still, we don't have any other questions. Right. Do any of Good. you want to add anything? We, we, we were kind of watching the time to make yeah. sure we got everybody's presentation accomplished and, um, and still have time for questions. So is there anything that any, any one of you would like to add that you kind of brushed over or rushed through earlier? Okay, well then we're gonna wrap it up. We'll be finished early today. So I hope you all enjoyed today's webinar. And uh, we, if, if you think of questions after we log off today, please feel free to send them to me and I will be happy to um, get the answers for you from one of our presenters. Also, if you're interested in a printed copy of this handout, please email me and we will, I will um, send that to you. I'm gonna scoot through to the end of these slides. And so you, uh, my um, phone number and email address is there for you to see. And sorry, it's not, it's a little animation there. So anyway, um, the recording of this webinar will be available on our website next week. So the, um, I will email everybody with the link to that and when it's live. So um, is this microphone? No. So um, if you um, just feel free to do that. And we have two more seminars this year. The next one is on July 9. It's the Estate Planning Basics in 2021 with attorney Debbie Kesey and certified financial planner, Phil Cook. They will be talking to us about that. And then in September on the 10th, we'll do boot camp for the executor. So that's if you're named as the executor of someone's estate and the, the presenters will walk you through what has to be done with that. So um, with that, I'm going to say thank you for joining us and have a wonderful weekend.